As Halloween approaches in this spooky time of ours, MCCT thought the time might be right for some fantastic tales of fanciful horror to remind us when scary was fun. Hence, Monroe County Civic Theater's Oktoberfest, a celebration of the works of that master of the macabre, Edgar Allan Poe. I'm your master of cemetery, ah, uh, ceremonies, your MC of fright and delight, Chili Billy Spears. Every Saturday from now to All Hallows' Eve, we'll trick and treat you with Poe prose and poetry, read by our friends and neighbors, the ghoulish but harmless good guys of your own community theater. Thanks to all our players. Join us, if you dare, at www.mcct.org and learn more about how you can play, too. While you're there, of course, you could drop a little treat in our bag to keep us going. We're all volunteer and non-profit. Bloomington's one and only. We survive and try to thrive on your much-appreciated donations. You can make one at www.mcct.org support. And now, what you came for. Poe and many of his stories are probably known or known of by most of you. Hollywood mined him for all he was worth and Britain hammered out films for decades. The original stories paid the price, the Vincent price, of movie rewrites. So to some, the originals may come as a surprise. Before we descend into the eloquent madness of his stories, let me tell you a little bit about Poe. Born in Massachusetts in 1809, he was a Poe boy from a Poe family. His parents were both actors. While his mother was pregnant with him, they were starring in a production of William Shakespeare's King Lear. They named him Edgar after the character Edgar from King Lear. What do you know? That's our boy Willie. He's everywhere. Poe's life was fraught with tragedy. He experienced a number of hardships and deaths early in his life. His father abandoned his family when he was one, and his mother died from tuberculosis when he was two. An orphan, he was taken in by the wealthy Allen family and was christened Edgar Allan Poe at the age of three, but by no means was that a happy ending to his story. His first love died when he was 15 years old, his foster mother died five years later, and he lost his brother two years after that. While Poe was riding the raven, his beloved wife Virginia was suffering from tuberculosis. Having lost his mother, brother, and foster mother to the disease, he must have known what the end would be. Perhaps that's the reason why his writings are a bit gloomy. Could it be? Do you think? The Raven was first published in 1845. It made Edgar Allan Poe a household name and turned him into a national celebrity. Children followed him in the street, flapping their arms and cawing. He would turn around and say, never more, and they would run away, shrieking. Though it made Poe popular in his day, scaring children didn't bring him much money. He stayed Poe. The Raven remains one of the most famous poems ever written. It's also the only poem that has an NFL team named after it. Here's Steve Scott to kick off, in a good sense, our Oktoberfest with a little raven of his own. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, and while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as if someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow. Vainly I had sought to borrow from my books the surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken Sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, 
some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. And open here I flung the shutter, then with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately ring of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven. Ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore, tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonium shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door. Bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door was such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered. Other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken. Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven, still beguiling all my fancy into smiling. Straight I wheeled a cushion seat in front of bird and bust and door. There, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy under fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking. Nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing, to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining with a lamp-like glowed o'er, but whose velvet 
violet lining with the lamp light glowing o'er. She shall press. Ah, never more. And then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. <coughs> prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent, whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. <coughs> prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp the sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word or sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked at starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. <coughs> and the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Poe is widely regarded as a major figure in Western literature. He was one of the country's earliest and most influential developers of the American short story. Poe's works had a far-reaching effect on writers of his day and into the 20th century. The next story even inspired elements in Oscar Wilde's 1891 novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray. The Oval Portrait was first published in 1842. Read by Margot Morton, it begins with an injured narrator seeking refuge in an abandoned mansion. Oh yeah, where have I seen this before? Don't go in there, Margot! In the Apennine Mountains of Italy. While exploring a room in the mansion, the narrator becomes captivated by a portrait of a young woman. The chateau into which my valet had ventured to make forcible entrance, rather than permit me, in my desperately wounded condition, to pass a night in the open air, was one of those piles of commingled gloom and grandeur which have so long frowned among the Apennines, not less in fact than in the fancy of Mrs. Radcliffe. To all appearance it had been temporarily and very lately abandoned. 
we establish ourselves in one of the smallest and least sumptuously furnished apartments. It lay in a remote turret of the building. Its decorations were rich, yet tattered and antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry and bedecked with manifold and multiform armorial trophies, together with an unusually great number of very spirited modern paintings in frames of rich golden arabesque. In these paintings, which depended from the walls not only in their main surfaces, but in very many nooks which the bizarre architecture of the chateau rendered necessary, in these paintings my incipient delirium, perhaps, had caused me to take deep interest, so that I bade Pedro to close the heavy shutters of the room, since it was already night, to light the tongues of a tall candelabrum which stood by the head of my bed, and to throw open far and wide the fringed curtains of black velvet which enveloped the bed itself. I wished all this done that I might resign myself, if not to sleep, at least alternately to the contemplation of these pictures, and the perusal of a small volume which had been found upon the pillow, and which purported to criticize and describe them. Long, long I read, and devoutly, devotedly I gazed. Rapidly and gloriously the hours flew by, and the deep midnight came. The position of the candelabrum displeased me, and, outreaching my hand with difficulty, rather than disturb my slumbering valet, I placed it so as to throw its rays more fully upon the book. But the action produced an effect altogether unanticipated. The rays of the numerous candles, for there were many, now fell within a niche of the room which had hitherto been thrown into deep shade by one of the bedposts. I thus saw in vivid light a picture all unnoticed before. It was the portrait of a young girl just ripening into womanhood. I glanced at the painting hurriedly, and then closed my eyes. Why I did this was not at first apparent, even to my own perception. But while my lids remained thus shut, I ran over in my mind my reason for so shutting them. It was an impulsive movement to gain time for thought to make sure that my vision had not deceived me, to calm and subdue my fancy for a more sober and more certain gaze. In a very few moments, I again looked fixedly at the painting. That I now saw aright, I could not and would not doubt, for the first flashing of the candles upon that canvas had seemed to dissipate the dreamy stupor which was stealing over my senses, and to startle me at once into waking life. The portrait, I have already said, was that of a young girl. It was a mere head and shoulders, done in what is technically termed a vignette manner, much in the style of the favorite heads of Sully. The arms, the bosom, and even the ends of the radiant hair melted imperceptibly into the vague yet deep shadow which formed the background of the whole. The frame was oval, richly gilded, and filigreed in moresque. As a thing of art, nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself. But it could have been neither the execution of the work, nor the immortal beauty of the countenance, which had so suddenly and so vehemently moved me. Least of all, could it have been that my fancy, shaken from its half-slumber, had mistaken the head for that of a living person." I saw at once that the peculiarities of the design, of the vignetting, and of the frame must have instantly dispelled such idea, must have prevented even its momentary entertainment. Thinking earnestly upon these points, I remained, for an hour perhaps, half sitting, half reclining, with my vision riveted upon the portrait. At length, satisfied with the true secret of its effect, I fell back within the bed, I had found the spell of the picture in an absolute life-likeliness of expression, which, at first startling, finally confounded, subdued, and appalled me. With deep and reverent awe, I replaced the candelabrum in its former position. The cause of my deep agitation being thus shut from view, I sought eagerly the volume which discussed the paintings and their histories. Turning to the number which designated the oval portrait, 
I there read the vague and quaint words which follow. She was a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee. And evil was the hour when she saw and loved and wedded the painter. He, passionate, studious, austere, and having already a bride in his art. She, a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee. All light and smiles, and frolicsome as the young fawn, loving and cherishing all things, hating only the art which was her rival, dreading only the palette and brushes and other untoward instruments which deprived her of the countenance of her lover. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray even his young bride. But she was humble and obedient, and sat meekly for many weeks in the dark high turret chamber, where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went on from hour to hour, and from day to day. And he was a passionate and wild and moody man, who became lost in reveries so that he would not see that the light which fell so ghastly in that lone turret withered the health and the spirits of his bride, who pined visibly to all but him. Yet she smiled on and still on, uncomplainingly, because she saw that the painter, who had high renown, took a fervid and burning pleasure in his task, and wrought day and night to depict her who so loved him, yet who grew daily more dispirited and weak. And in sooth, some who beheld the portrait spoke of its resemblance in low words, as of a mighty marvel, and a proof not less of the power of the painter than of his deep love for her whom he depicted so surpassingly well. But at length, as the labor drew nearer to its conclusion, there were admitted none into the turret, for the painter had grown wild with the ardor of his work, and turned his eyes from the canvas rarely, even to regard the countenance of his wife. And he would not see that the tents which he spread upon the canvas were drawn from the cheeks of her who sat beside him. And when many weeks had passed, and but little remained to do, save one brush upon the mouth and one tent upon the eye, the spirit of the lady again flickered up, as the flame within the socket of the lamp. And then the brush was given, and then the tent was placed. And, for one moment, the painter stood entranced before the work which he had wrought. But in the next, while he yet gazed, he grew tremulous and very pallid and aghast and crying with a loud voice, This is indeed life itself! Turned suddenly to regard his beloved, she was dead. The next Poe reading comes from Dan Heiss. First published in 1846, the cast of Amontillado is also set in Italy in an unnamed city. The narrator Montresor has planned to revenge himself on the unsuspecting Fortunato, who he believes has insulted him and his family honor. Montresor lures him into the wine cellar, meaning to shut him up for good. Fortunato had hurt me a thousand times, and I'd suffered quietly. Then I learned that he had laughed at my proud name, Montresor, the name of an old and honored family. Oh, I promised myself that I would make him pay for this, that I would have revenge. You must not suppose, however, that I spoke of this to anyone. I'd make him pay, yes, but I'd act with only with the greatest care. I must not suffer as a result of taking my revenge, or wrong is not made right in that manner. And also, the wrong wouldn't be made right unless Fortunato knew he was paying, and knew who was forcing him to pay. 
I gave Fortunato no cause to doubt me. I continued to smile in his face, and he didn't understand that now I was smiling at the thought of what I planned for him, at the thought of my revenge. Fortunato was a strong man, a man to be feared. But he had one great weakness. He liked to drink fine wine, and indeed he drank much of it. So he knew a lot about fine wines, and proudly believed that he was a trained judge of them. I, too, knew old wines well, and I bought the best I could find. And wine, I thought, wine would give me my revenge. It was almost dark, one evening in the spring, when I met Fortunato in the street, alone. He spoke to me more warmly than was usual, for already he drunk more wine than was good for him. I acted pleased to see him, and I shook his hand as if he'd been my closest friend. Fortunato, how are you? Montresor, good evening, my friend. My dear Fortunato, I'm indeed glad that I've met you. I was just thinking about you, for I've been tasting my new wine, and I've bought a cask full of a fine wine, which they tell me is a Montiato. But a Montiato? <laughs> Quite impossible. I know. I, it doesn't seem possible. As I could not find you, I was just going to talk to Lucreshi. If anyone understands wines, it's Lucreshi. Well, he, he'll tell me that Lucreshi, he does not know one wine from another. Oh, but they say he knows as much about wines as you know. <laughs> oh, no, come. Let us go. Go where? Uh, to your vaults. Taste the wine. Oh, no, my friend, no, no, I can see that you're not well, and the vaults are cold and wet. I don't care, let's go, I'm well enough, the cold's nothing. Amontillado, <laughs> someone's playing games with you, and Lucreshi, oh, Lucreshi knows nothing about wines, nothing at all. As he spoke, Fortunato took my arm, and I allowed him to hurry me to my great stone palace, where my family, the Montresors, had lived for centuries. There was no one at home. I told the servants that they must not leave the place, as I would not return until the following morning, and they must care for the place. This, I knew, was enough to make certain that they would all leave, as soon as my back was turned. I took down from their places on the wall two brightly burning lights, gave one of these to Fortunato, and led him to a wide doorway. There we could see the stone steps going down into the darkness. Asking him to be careful as he followed, I went down before him, down under the ground, deep under the old walls of my palace. We came finally to the bottom of the steps and stood there for a moment, together. The earth which formed the floor was cold and hard. We were entering the last resting place of the dead of the Montresor family. Here, too, we kept our finest wines, here in the cool, dark, still air under the ground. Fortunato's step was not sure because of the wine that he'd been drinking. He looked uncertainly around him, trying to see through the thick darkness which pushed in around us. Here our brightly burning light seemed weak indeed, but our eyes soon became used to the darkness, and we could see the bones of the dead lying large piles along the walls. The stones of the walls were wet and cold. From the long rows of bottles which were lying on the floor among the bones, I chose one which contained a very good wine. Since I didn't have anything to open the bottle with, I struck the stone wall with it and broke off the small end. I offered the bottle to Fortunato. Here, Fortunato, drink some of this fine Madoc. It will help to keep us warm. Drink! Thank you, my friend. I drink to the dead, who lie sleeping around us. And I, Fortunato, I drink to your long life. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Mm, a very fine wine, indeed. But the Amontillado. Oh, it's further on. Come on. We walked on for some time. We were now under the river's bed, and water fell in drops upon us from above. Deeper into the ground we went, past still more bones. Your vaults are many and large. There seems to be no end to them. 
We are a great family, and an old one. It's not far now, but I can, I can see you trembling with the cold. Come, let, let us go back before it's too late. It is nothing. <laughs> oh, let us go on. But first, another drink of your Madoc. I took up from among the bones another bottle. It was another wine of a fine quality, a de grave. And I broke off the neck, and I handed Fortunato the bottle. He took it and drank it all without stopping for a breath. He laughed and threw the empty bottle over his shoulder. We went on, deeper and deeper into the earth. Finally, we arrived at a vault in which the air was so old and heavy that our lights almost died. Against three of the walls there were piles of bones higher than our heads. From the fourth, someone had pulled down all the bones, and they were spread all around us on the ground. In the middle of the wall was an opening into another vault, if I can call it that, a little room about three feet wide, six or seven feet high, and perhaps four feet deep. It was hardly more than a hole in the wall. Uh, go on! Go in! I, the Amontillado is in there! Fortunato continued to go forward, uncertainly. I followed him immediately. Soon, of course, he reached the back wall. He stood there for a moment, facing the wall, surprised and wondering. In that wall there were two heavy iron rings. A short chain was hanging from one of these and a lock from the other. Before Fortunato could guess what was happening, I closed the lock and chained him tightly to the wall. He stepped back. Fortunato, I said, put your hand against the wall. You must feel how the water runs over it. Now once more I ask you, please, will you not go back? No? Oh, if not, then I must leave you here. But first, I must do everything I can for you. But, but the, the Amontillado? Ah, yes, indeed, the Amontillado. And as I spoke these words, I began to search among the bones. Throwing them to one side, I found the stones, which earlier I had taken down from the wall. I quickly, I began to build the wall again, covering the hole where Fortunato stood, trembling. Montresor, what are you doing? I continued working. I could hear him pulling at the chain, shaking it wildly. Only a few stones remained in their place. Montresor! <laughs> oh, that was a very good joke indeed. Many times we'll laugh about this <laughs> as we drink our wine together. <laughs> of course, as we drink the Amontillado. What is it not, late? Should we not be getting back? They'll be expecting us. Let's go. Yes. Let us go. And as I said this, I lifted the last stone from the ground. Madrasa! For the love of God! Yes. For the love of God! I heard no answer. Fortunato! I cried. Fortunato. I heard only a low, soft sound, a half cry of fear. My heart was sick. It must have been the cold. I hurried to force the last stone into its position, and I put the old bones again in a pile against the wall. For half a century now, no human hand has touched them. Rest in peace. That concludes the first episode in MCCT's month-long celebration of Poe. Thanks for listening. Remember, we'll have a new episode of Poe Readings every Saturday this October. Make sure to check out our website and social media pages for the video links. Until next time, this is Chili Billy Spears wishing you pleasant dreams. If you have any trouble getting to sleep after these stories, perhaps a little Amontillado would help you rest. In peace. Good night.